Hi, welcome to AETCM. Today, we are going to discuss a case about a 57-year-old female who was brought in her ER with complaints of myalgia with weakness for the past 5 days and it was uh, also she was also having decreased urine output since last one day. Sir, shall you begin, sir? Yes. Sir, <coughs> on initial assessment, patient was conscious and oriented. Coming to uh, airway, it was patent, no secretions are not. And in breathing, air entry was bilaterally equal. Uh, respiratory rate was 38 per minute. And uh, saturation of 98 degree, 98 uh, percent maintained in room air. Bilateral basal curves were noted. Uh, coming to circulation, uh, BP was 90 over 60 mmHg with pulse rate of 98 per minute. And patient was on uh, noradrenaline and dopamine infusion on reaching our hospital. So, coming to disability, GCS score was E4, V5, M, M6 with pupil of 2.5 mm bilaterally equally reacting. And temperature was uh, afibrile with GRBS of 103 mg per deciliter. E, uh, ECG showed normal sinus rhythm uh, with heart rate of 9, 98 per minute and uh, ABG was showing metabolic acidosis with compensation. Uh, so, so come, uh, in secondary survey, uh, she was a 57 year old female, uh, known case of hypertension and hypothyroidism uh, on tyroxine, uh, complaints of generalized weakness with myalgia since past 5 days. Along with, <coughs> along with it, uh, she had insidious onset and gradually pro progressive breathlessness uh, since one day. <coughs> he, uh, she also complains of uh, decreased urine output since a day and uh, com complete anuria for more than 12 hours. History of chills present, but no history of any uh, fever or uh, vomiting, abdominal pain, and altered sensorium. Uh, and no history of any chest pain or uh, bleeding manifestations also. Sir. She was taken to a nearby hospital for the same and was uh, found to have low platelet count and elevated. You are told about anuria. Yeah. What is the immediate step you do in the ER to know whether it is anuria or something else? Anuria means complete uh, absence of urine. Hmm. Anuria is an, a marker of obstructive urinary disorder. Okay. Obstructive. Okay. okay. So, what is the immediate step you do? Catheterization can... It is, we can palpate the bladder. You have to palpate the bladder. Because the, if bladder is present, then anuria is there, then the reasons are different. Okay. If bladder is absent, then anuria is there, then reasons are different. So, either you can palpate the urinary bladder and see whether it is full or not. Second thing, you can do an ultrasound. Okay. It can easily pick up a, a full bladder. Mm. Okay. So, catheterization is only secondary thing. Okay. If there is a full bladder, then immediately you have to catheterize. If there is no full bladder, even if you catheterize, there is no immediate benefit <coughs> from that. Unnecessarily, you are introducing another problem there. Okay. So, always check the bladder or look for ultrasound bladder. Okay, both are equally important in ER because we have an ultrasound mission in our ER. We have to make use of that. Okay. <coughs> yeah. And uh, from the out, outside hospital, uh, was, she was found to have low platelets and high creatine, creatinine level, 6.4 from the outside hospital with the hypotension. Urea? Urea was uh, 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 160 from our hospital, sir. 160. Uh, 160. And was ref uh, referred to our hospital for further management. <coughs> On general examination, patient was moderately built and nourished. Uh, no, there was no signs of any pyloric clubbing lymphadenopathy. Uh, BP was uh, 100 over 60 with pulse rate of 94 per minute and saturation of 96 degree maintained in room air. Uh, respiratory rate was uh, 30 per minute. Sir. Systemic examination, uh, respiratory system showed uh, bilateral ba basal curves with air and bilaterally equal and uh, other systems are within normal limits. So, in a patient who is having renal failure, who is having tachypnea, bilateral basal crepitations, what is your diagnosis? What is the immediate step you do? Because uh, here the respiratory rate is 30, saturation is 98. Mm. Okay. So, what is the immediate step you do as a ER physician? Yeah. Is the patient is in respiratory failure or not? Clinically, he is in respiratory distress. He is going to, he is going to, uh, he is going to <coughs> have respiratory failure in another half an hour if you don't treat. What is the immediate step you do, uh, sir? If the BP is stable, we can. Uh, no, no. What is the immediate step you do here? 
BP is stable. He is on whether noradrenaline or whatever it is. He, now the BP is stable. Start on NIV. Start on NIV. That is the best way to treat uh, respiratory distress in a patient who is having renal failure. Because it can be ARDS as a part of uremia. Or it can be due to fluid overload as a part of renal failure. Both are, uh, the treatment is NIV only. Okay, not simple oxygen, face mask oxygen. nasal prongs and they all will not work you have to start and navy mm. only problem anticipated problem is he can have some mm. hypotension, hypotension that we have to take care mm. okay otherwise this patient will go to respiratory arrest if you don't treat okay so immediately start the patient on and navy you can wait for the chest x ray that's okay in er if you are able to take an x ray it's, it can be done but clinically you know that uh, this patient is in uremic lung mm. so uh, so uh, Uh, we on, on reaching uh, after asked the uh, respiratory rate was uh, about uh, 30 we we immediately start patient on uh, nav sir and uh, we did the chest x ray and also uh, lab values lab fersen and the uh, lab came back which showed a creatinine of 7.6 with urea 160 and uh, crp was 367 and also platelet count was 24000 okay uh, total count was uh, about 12000 and uh, hemoglobin was 10 sir and uh, so hemoglobin 10 uh, what <coughs> what it indicates somebody is having elevated creatinine with a hemoglobin of 10 most probably it is acute kidney so injury. it is mostly acute kidney mm. injury suppose it is chronic renal failure and he, she had never come to hospital then uh, the hp person can be still low still because low. of erythropoietin reduced erythropoietin production so here it is a no- near normal hemoglobin rules out a chronic renal failure from that aspect so uh, yeah, we started uh, her on niv and uh, uh, later on uh, we came to know that uh, she was having uh, leptospirosis uh, following which uh, she developed acute kidney injury okay. and uh, uh, her uh, further management was uh, according to the same as and uh, for uh, renal failure but uh, we we also looked for the uh, potassium values which were uh, 4.4 were no signs of any Uh, hyperkalemia features in uh, in ECG. ECG also. What sir. are the ECG changes of hyperkalemia? ECG <coughs> hyper, uh, usually uh, can be tall, tall T waves. Okay. Uh, then there will be uh, QR prolongation. Uh, then PR prolonged, uh, PR PRS prolongation. prolonged, T wave prolonged. T, T. Finally, all these things will be prolonged, and you get a very tall T waves. This is called a sine wave pattern. Sine wave pattern. Okay, mm. but the commonest presentation of hyperkalemia to emergency room is bradycardia. Mm. Okay, so any patient who is having renal failure coming with bradycardia, what is the treatment? Any hyperkalemia. Any patient who is having hy- bradycardia, that normal treatment is atropin. <coughs> but in hyperkalemia induced uh, hyperkali, sorry, bradycardia, it may not work. So you treat it as hyperkalemia induced bradycardia you can give calcium gluconate, calcium gluconate, gluconate and other things so the commonest presentation of hyperkalemia in chronic renal failure is bradycardia okay that if you follow up the patient you will understand mm. but here it is a acute uh, uh, hyperkalemia because of hy- acute uh, renal failure. failure so we have to see the ecg and treat the mm. patient okay so there is no ecg mm. change no ecg changes are not sir okay. and uh, again Hmm. She uh, uh, she was uh, take, uh, taken in BiPAP uh, NIV and uh, for the fo- uh, following days. Uh, How do you set the BiPAP or uh, NIV? How will you set for this patient? He is having pulmonary edema. Settings of uh, mm. CPAP. So basically, it has got IPAP and EPAP. So we have to support both the ventilatory efforts of the patient and also the patient is having some fluid in the alveoli. Mm. So in order to wash, uh, push that out, we have to increase the PEEP also. Okay. So starting, you can actually uh, set uh, like a 12-6 or something like a baseline value. And depending on the patient's improving symptoms, we can adjust the BiPAP. Okay. So the basic idea is in an acute ARDS or a pulmonary edema patient, he will require some more extra PEEP than a physiological PEEP to push out the fluid from the alveoli. Okay. And to improve the effort, we have to increase the IPAP according to the patient's improvement of effort. Okay. So later this patient was actually uh, pushed up to uh, 16 by 8 okay. after which he was uh, stabilized with the NIV. Okay. Slightly higher pressure is required in mm. permanent radium. Mm. Only problem you anticipate is hypotension. 
Okay, so before starting, we already increase our node uh, to a bit more higher level so that we can get a BP above 100. No, so strong. better to increase the BP so with noradrenaline, then you start BiPAP so it will give better benefits. Once you start on BiPAP, what is the second thing? What are the ways you can reduce the pulmonary edema other than starting BiPAP and noradrenaline is already there. What else you can give? Mm, diuretics can be... Diuretics because renal failure is there. Even if you give diuretic, nothing will happen. Mm -hmm. How do you how do you re relieve the symptoms of uh, pulmonary edema? One is by pap. Next will be NTG. NTG. NTG is the next important drug. Okay. So NTG here started on, not for coronary artery disease. It is to dilate the arteries. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you can dilate the arteries by NTG so that the heart can pump against uh, these arteries. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the, that will relieve some amount of pulmonary edema. Renal failure should be relieved by only dialysis mm. here because mm. it's an acute renal failure. It's a renal shutdown. Yes. Whether you give Lasix or not, it is not going to improve. Okay, continue. Mm. Then, then uh, following which, uh, uh, she was taken for dialysis also. So how do you know that it is a, a pre-renal, uh, how do you uh, like rules out pre-renal failure? We don't know whether it's a uh, fluid deficit uh, renal failure or not. Mm. How do you rule out? Uh, um, we did a echo for uh, rolling out any uh, cardiac failure features mm -hmm. and also uh, uh, we asked for any signs of any GI symptoms, uh, diarrhea, vomiting, uh, pre-renal uh, and also any uh, 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 liver uh, no, pathologies. Yeah, IVC point here? IVC uh, can be collapsed in uh, case of pre-renal failure, sir. But uh, here uh, IVC was patent, sir. Okay. Suppose you are not able to <coughs> check the IVC, your ultrasound machine is not there. How do you prove that this is not pre-renal failure? You can try giving actually 500 ml bolus so and see if this is your output. Okay. So you give bolus of uh, 500 ml, that will improve the urinary, so like uh, urinary okay. shutdown mm -hmm. in a patient who is having pre-renal failure. The only problem is this patient is already having pulmonary edema. Can we give fluid? Yes, sir. Still we can, we can give mm -hmm. because we are, whatever <coughs> fluid we are giving, Normal salinity is going to intravascular compartment. It comes out from the intravascular compartment only after some time. So you can safely give uh, I, uh, 500 ml normal saline in this patient and see whether the patient develops any good urine output or good BP, whatever it is. If it is not there, then no need to continue second bolus. Okay. If the patient improves by urine output, then you can give fluids. Okay. But instead of that, if you give LASIX, what will happen? Like and whatever, the, whatever there in the intravascular compartment, you oh, will be trying to remove it. Okay. So, never try to give LASIX unnecessarily in a patient is having renal failure. If there is no urine output, if you have to find out what is the reason, whether it is a pre-renal failure or renal failure. Renal failure, dialysis is the treatment, not LASIX. LASIX will be helpful only if there is a urine output with volume overload. Okay. Okay. Uh, later. Uh, uh, dialysis was done, sir, and uh, following which uh, she was uh, uh, improving. What are the this? common indications <coughs> for dialysis other than simple going for a creatine uh, rate? And and, uh, sir, other indications. Metabolic acidosis is an indication, okay. sir. Okay, refractory metabolic, metabolic acidosis. Uh, electrolyte imbalance. Sir, Severe is. hyperkalemia, not relieved uh, by routine treatment. Uh, then toxic ingestions. Okay, that is toxicological need here. In volume the, overload. Volume overload, pulmonary edema without mm -hmm. not relieved with LASIX. Then you, you read me features. Uh, what are the features? Uh, Altered uh, behavior, pericarditis, <coughs> all these things. If it is there, then you have to dialyze the patient. Then toxicologically, some uh, toxins are, can be removed by dialysis. There you have to do it. Then, then uh, persistent hypothesis. Already my again not resolving can okay that yeah, already so these are the indications for dialysis here dialysis is done for uh, pulmonary edema okay. Yeah. okay after which uh, she was uh, uh, regaining her uh, uh, BP was uh, regained improved improved and uh, dialysis uh, following dialysis uh, on the later date also uh, we done uh, dialysis okay. for uh, next three days we had done dialysis. what may be the reason for hypertension here you told IVC is full. What may be the reason? Coronary is a global hypokinesia of the left ventricle because in sepsis and all, you can get global hypokinesia. 
in a routine uh, echo done in er will not pick up that okay because of tachycardia most of the findings may be masked okay so you may not get it mm. okay but that is a common most important reason for hypotension in patient who is having severe sepsis including leptospirosis myocarditis myocarditis and lv dysfunction okay sir okay for which uh, she improved after uh, uh, the three days of dialysis she improved and okay Uh, dialysis was stopped okay. and uh, we managed later on with uh, supportive care antibiotic also was what yeah. antibiotic is started for le- suspected leptospirosis uh, doxycycline was started sir okay uh, along with it uh, we have al- also given uh, uh, what are the antibiotics can be used for leptospirosis <coughs> doxycycline can give almost any, any antibiotic anything can be given okay. anything will work acetromycin doxycycline penicillins no need to give higher antibiotics simple antibiotics are enough for leptospirosis but there are two phases of leptospira in initial phase is leptospiremic phase second phase is wheel syndrome wheel syndrome will antibiotic work yeah, once we release the once the multi organ dysfunction syndrome occurs these antibiotics will never work okay only supportive therapy will be useful okay platelet what you did low platelet uh, we started on ff ff ffps and uh, low platelet what is it low platelets why you started ffp low platelet what how uh, fluid the, correction platelet 20000 platelet what thing is continuous monitoring is required so only yeah. monitoring is required because this patient does not have any bleeding tendency count is 20000 we no need to intervene at all we have to just monitor whether it is coming still coming down less than 10000 or any clinical bleeding is there otherwise no need to <coughs> inr uh, is it then inr is 1.2 1.2 it is not a uh, no, no, problem no, no, no. more than 1.5 in a normal person it should be alarming uh, range otherwise it is not not okay like it is okay oh, what happened to the patient afterwards uh, patient after the three days of dialysis became stable and okay so the patient no. improved after dialysis mm. and uh, leptospira was uh, treated with uh, doxycycline. doxycycline okay chest x ray what it showed chest x ray showed features of pulmonary ma- bilateral okay there. what are the danger signs in leptospirosis danger signs mm. uh, features of multi which patient will die multi organ failure really multi organ dysfunction some patient <coughs> see after one week one and a half weeks they develop some amount of multi organ dysfunction they will not become bad but early early features of multi like second or third day mm-hmm. they develop complications then they, it is very dangerous mm-hmm. second thing is pulmonary hemorrhage pulmonary oh, alveolar, alveolar hemorrhage. hemorrhage okay that looks like pulmonary edema only in x ray mm-hmm. white shadows but when you are intubating you can see blood in the mm-hmm. tube. tube okay or aspirating you can see blood that type of patients will die because uh, pulmonary alve- alveolar hemorrhage is a dangerous complication most of the patients will die mortality is very high mm-hmm. and early multi organ dysfunction also mortality is very high mm-hmm. okay anything else mm-hmm. sir uh, if in the uh, renal failure uh, acute kidney injury uh, we can cl- uh, classify them according to rifle criteria rifle uh, stands for uh, uh, risk injury failure uh, loss of kidney function end organ uh, kidney so uh, for uh, initial uh, r uh, rifle stands for uh, less than 0.5 ml per kg of uh, urine output uh, in the last 6 hours uh, 6 to 12 hours or uh, creatinine value greater than 1.5 times of the normal uh, or the same and the uh, injury part uh, the urine output will be uh, less than 0.5 ml per kg per hour or the 12 to 24 hours or creatinine value above Uh, two times of the normal and the failure part uh, rf uh, uh, the uh, urine output will be less than 0.3 ml per kg per hour for the uh, greater than 24 hours or creatinine value above three times of the normal and uh, um, loss of kidney function there will be uh, we will be needing uh, dialysis for more than one month or in the end organ stage uh, will be needing dialysis for more than three months uh, usually uh, we do uh, further management according to the rifle criteria and also uh, we have uh, kidney uh, kidigo criteria 
wherein which uh, we can uh, classify according to urine output and also kidney uh, creatinine values uh, urine output are uh, one stages uh, divided into three in which uh, stage one uh, it be urine output will be less than 0.5 ml or the six hours or uh, in creatinine uh, will be greater than uh, 0.3 ml per as 48 hours or 1.5 to 1.9 times of the normal baseline creatinine value and in stage 2 uh, the your output will be less than 0.5 for 24 uh, up to 12 hours or creatinine values greater than 2 to 2.9 times of the normal and the stage 3 creatinine values will be above 3 times of the normal or your output will be uh, less than 0.3 for 24 hours or anuria for 12, less than 12 hours greater than 12 hours sir. so basically a patient coming to <coughs> AK uh, we can class it <coughs> Coming with AK, you can classify according to rifle criteria. Mm -hmm. There is actually a risk, uh, it's actually five components. In that three is severity grading and two is outcome based. Uh, three is actually one is risk, second is injury, third is failure. So considering the arrival creatine, if it is uh, at around 1.5 times the base 10, it is risk. Patient is having a higher risk. Next, if it is above two, it is uh, suspecting an acute kidney injury. And it is above three times this is an impending failure, or maybe patient already attained failure. And the outcome by if the patient is, ha is having persistent renal failure for more than four weeks, it is actually a loss of renal function. We can classify as loss, loss of renal function. And if it is more than three months, it is actually more like an end stage kidney disease. You will require for al almost lifetime uh, hemodialysis as management. So this is the rifle criteria. And also, if a patient is coming with AK or like an uh, acute uh, with no previous history of renal, uh, renal dysfunction, uh, we can uh, think about three areas of like uh, etiology. One is intrinsic, one is pre-renal, and one is post-renal. Pre-renal would be like an acute uh, injury, like in, in, due to hypovolemia, due to some fluid loss, or maybe due to persistent hypotension, or maybe any reason which means having some is causing uh, decreased fluid into the kidneys maybe like a real vascular disease also which can be a cause of that so which we have to uh, evaluate and then correct as necessary like as we discussed we can even try giving fluid boluses or assess the like ivc status and again uh, replenish the fluid load so that we can uh, try if the patient is improving or not mm -hmm. second the intrinsic will be secondary to like an acute injury secondary to some infections or maybe secondary to autoimmune uh, diseases or something like that that actual kidney is injured it could be like pyelonephritis or maybe due to SLE or autoimmune diseases and all that. In which the according to the uh, condition we have to manage the treat this thing, we have to decide the treatment. Next will be post renal, secondary to any obstructive uropathy, which could be like an intravascular lumen obstruction, like a urethral calicula or even a sloughed off uh, this thing from the kidney due to secondary to pyelonephritis or something, obstructing the distant ureter. So it can actually create pressure effect back to the a kidney and giving cause injury. It's the only problem when, when we give more fluids. More fluid. Here, it can produce a, a worsening of the function. Yeah. So that so, is, uh, we have to be very careful. Mm. So, obstetric uropathy can be due to intraluminal cause or maybe even extra luminal cause, secondary to some malignancy or something, putting pressure over the ureter. So, basically, coming in a patient with, into the ED with acute kidney injury, we can do a simple USG to rule out the patient, does the patient already have a medical renal disease? by looking at the features of the uh, cortical structures of the kidney whether there is already established CKD or it is an acute a differentiation if differentiation is persisting ah. then it is a good kidney good kidney otherwise it is not you know, like a chronic kidney and depending on that we can decide on our management so pre-renal we try to replenish our fluid this thing and all that and look for improvement intrinsic we treat the actual cause of the uh, disease and the post renal we try to clear the obstruction. The patient will require ultroscopy, DGS shending, and all those procedures, urologic procedures to um, make the lumen intact, which can actually relieve the pressure effect and also improve the kidney function. Some acute tubular necrosis afterwards, so you can see a uh, lot uh, of urine output. Uh, is it a good sign? Uh, it is a good sign. It's a good sign. If the urine output is increasing mm -hmm. than a normal this one, then it's a good sign. Mm -hmm. So that also you should consider. Mm -hmm. So our patient basically an acute leptospirosis patient with an AK. Uh, she initially was uh, brought Now you have to tell it is a wheel syndrome. Wheel syndrome. Uh, with the leptospirosis is an infection by leptospira. Mm -hmm. Now it has become a syndrome. Mm -hmm. That is wheel syndrome. Mm -hmm. So initial arrival, uh, she was airway everything was patent, but she was in hypotension uh, with some distress. <coughs> so we started on NIV after improving her systemic BP to above 100 by increasing our knowledge support and everything. We started on NIV. Then as soon as early as possible, we secured a femoral catheter and dialyzed her uh, for because I was having the pretty distress and uh, this AK. And after about uh, three this thing, uh, continuous dialysis and 
for the management she clinically improved uh, so over time we were able to taper off our nord support and along with that she was weaned off by pap and with over two she was maintained for a few more days then she was completely weaned off all supports okay. uh, now she has clinically improved and she was recently discharged okay yes, sir okay thank you